An activist and a former lawmaker were arrested in Pakistan on Sunday. What does this say about the country which is heading for elections very soon? South Korea has reportedly unfrozen Iranian assets that it was holding on to. What deal was struck to enable this? And doctors and dentists in New Zealand are set to go on strike in the first week of September. What are their demands? This is a daily debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before we go any further, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Our first story is from Pakistan, which is heading to an election soon. On Sunday, former lawmaker Ali Wazir and activist Iman Mazari were arrested by Islamabad police. They had both attended a rally by the PTM, the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, on the previous day. As viewers of the show know, Ali Wazir has been a long-time target of the security forces in the country as he has advocated for the rights of the Pashtun community. The arrest come at a time when Pakistan has a new interim government, which will preside over a general election in just a few months. We go to Abdul for the story. Abdul, thanks for joining us. Uh, Abdul, can you begin by telling us what action has been taken against these activists, the kind of work they did, and also a, a, little, but, a little bit about the activists themselves? Well, uh, let's start with the, uh, the basic background of these activists. Uh, one arrested is Iman uh, Mazari, a human rights uh, lawyer, and one Ali Wazir, a well-known uh, activist, human rights activist, plus political activist. Also, he has been a member of Pakistan parliament uh, and has been leading uh, a PTM, Pakhtun uh, Tafazul movement. This basically, uh, uh, leads a movement against the atrocities, uh, alleged atrocities committed by Pakistan army in uh, uh, tribal areas and in KP province, Pakistan's uh, Khyber province, in the name of fighting terrorism. So uh, there have been allegations made by PTM and other uh, human rights groups that Pakistan army in the name of fighting terrorism has basically involved in extrajudicial killings, uh, in, uh, enforced uh, disappearance of uh, thousands of people from that province and other human rights violations. And they have been fighting against this for a very long time. And because of that, Ali Wazir in particular have been arrested several times uh, in the past. He was released in February after spending two years in jail and then again briefly arrested in June as well. Uh, Iman is, of course, fi uh, fights cases uh, uh, for ETM and other human rights violations uh, and has been very vocal. Both of them have been very vocal against Pakistan army's role. So in this particular uh, 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 scenario, the, there were two FIRs filed on Saturday uh, on the basis of a PTM rally on Friday near Islamabad, in which uh, Iman in particular, there is a video which is circulating uh, on social media, which, in which she is very basically strongly uh, saying that uh, uh, the, uh, the Pakistan army is basically uh, colliding with the terrorist groups in uh, Pakistan and uh, harming the, the democratic forces and the innocent people. And therefore, she demands a release of all those who have been illegally detained by the army, demands uh, court martial cases against the army officials and so on and so forth. So on the basis of this particular speech, uh, uh, the FIR was filed. And as per the details in the Pakistani media, the FIR strictly talks about uh, uh, PTM rally, those who participated in, and particularly Iman and Ali Wazir, uh, uh, charging them with uh, intimidating civil servants, trying to uh, 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 prevent them from uh, executing their duties, uh, 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 provoking rioting, uh, uh, hatred against the state, conspiring against the state, and uh, uh, demeaning state institutions. It does not say army, but that is what uh, it basically means. So this is, you can say, is a larger part of uh, uh, the uh, the anti uh, all those people who have been very critical to the role of the army, 
So that has basically uh, led to the uh, this particular uh, instance. Abdul, all of this is happening against the backdrop of elections not very far away in Pakistan. Could you put all of this, zoom out a bit and look at how that process will look? Well, uh, at this moment, Pakistan is run by a caretaker prime minister uh, as per the Pakistan constitution. Uh, and, and that caretaker government has primary responsibility of conducting the national elections, which are scheduled in November. But uh, there are doubts, already there are doubts that those elections may get delayed. Uh, though uh, the opposition parties are pushing for uh, election on time, but it is not very clear whether it will happen as per the schedule. Uh, and at this moment, it is also very clear that uh, uh, it seems uh, there are uh, uh, comments made by uh, uh, different uh, people who follow Pakistan politics very closely that there is an attempt by the Pakistan uh, uh, ruling establishment, in particular the dominant uh, uh, ruling establishment, which is which can be uh, identified as an army, trying to silence all kind of uh, political forces which have been very critical to army's role in Pakistan politics, army's role in the human right uh, situation in, uh, uh, in Pakistan, and so on and so forth. And that basically gives us the larger context in which we can see how uh, Pakistan's main opposition party, the PTI, uh, Pakistan Tehreek Insaf, led by Imran Khan, former prime minister, is basically on the, on the receiving end. Uh, 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 Imran Khan is already in, behind bars, which is not clear whether he will be able to contest the elections or not. His uh, vice president, PTI's vice president, sorry, um, uh, uh, Mamusa Qureshi was arrested on Friday in the case which is uh, related to uh, uh, documents which basically were cited by Imran Khan for uh, as a, uh, as a evidence for uh, uh, external conspiracy for uh, behind his removal from uh, prime minister post his government's sacking. Uh, the cipher case uh, in Pakistan right. politics. Uh, and then uh, there is a crackdown ongoing against all PTI uh, activists from top to bottom, leaders and activists. A large number of them have already left the party under, allegedly under the pressure exerted by the army and state institutions. And uh, some of them are also targeted now. That This is one part of it. Apart from what we were discussing about uh, uh, activists like Imad or the smaller parties or a political opposition which uh, is represented by groups like Awami League or uh, um, uh, Awami Party, sorry, or the PTM uh, like human rights groups. So all these, uh, there is a large scale, uh, uh, you can say, in the absence of any other word, a crackdown, it seems, going on in Pakistan against all these groups which are considered to be a question, uh, uh, considered to be uh, questioning or kind of delegitimizing the role of army in Pakistan's politics. And that basically, given the uncertainty about the elections and this cra crackdown, it seems that Pakistan at this moment is again uh, uh, at a very uh, uh, crucial and very uh, critical stage. Right, Abdul. Uh, and Abdul, if you just wait for a couple of minutes, we'll be back with you. Our next story is from the corridors of diplomacy. South Korea has reportedly transferred Iranian assets it was holding on to to Switzerland, according to media reports. This follows a deal between Iran and the United States whereby Iran could access those assets in return for the release of five U.S. citizens who were detained. If this deal is completed, Iran could access $6 billion in assets. We'll return to Abdul for more. Abdul, now there actually has been talk about this deal for quite some time. Can you give us whatever details we have some so far about the assets as well as the U.S. citizens who seem to be in question? Uh, okay, briefly, it seems that this is an exchange deal. Uh, five American uh, citizens uh, arrested and uh, locked inside Iran will be released in exchange of uh, $6 billion of Iranian assets, which were frozen in South Korea, uh, uh, will be uh, uh, unfrozen and uh, basically released. So uh, this seems to be the, the, the gist of the deal, which is uh, uh, currently there between Iran and the US, uh, negotiated by an unknown third country. Uh, 
there are speculations about that whether it is oman or qatar or some other country but yeah uh, iranians are claiming that this is not an exchange deal uh, yes they are ready to release the five prisoners and that is a separate deal uh, they have been moved out of jail and into the house arrest most of these five prisoners are basically uh, american citizens who have been charged with spying uh, while in iran uh, 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 and that is why they are they are been some of them since 2015. Uh, 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 that is one. Uh, but uh, the U.S. is claiming that this is primarily a exchange uh, deal. So, as per the latest information, the six billion dollars which were frozen uh, in South Korea after South Korea cited the uh, U.S. sanctions as the reason behind it uh, uh, is released. Six billion dollars have been released, and they have sent to a, a bank in Switzerland. And ultimately, it will reach Qatar. Uh, and from there, Iranians can use it to buy uh, uh, whatever commodities they need, provided those commodities are not uh, in the sanction list uh, in the US. So that is one uh, part of the deal. Uh, that is primarily the deal which is uh, there. Uh, uh, and one uh, last thing, which is. Uh, uh, significant about this deal is uh, Iranians uh, there are other uh, uh, prisoners in the Iranian prisoners sorry in the US which uh, Iranians are claiming should also be released from the US prison but the US have denied it so uh, this is uh, the the fact these are the facts which are available in public domain at this moment Abdul, now this would make anyone think that this is part of the sort of zigzag relationship that uh, has existed between Iran and the United States for quite some time. So, uh, what is the state of play over here? What can we expect to happen in the future? Uh, it seems that uh, there is no uh, building up uh, on the basis of this deal. Uh, both the US and Iranians have completely denied that this, uh, these deals are related to the the uh, the larger uh, problems with uh, between Iran and the U.S., which of course had a larger geostrategic and geopolitical aspect of behind it. But if we were to narrow it down uh, on the issue of the nuclear deal, which, uh, with which uh, uh, from which U.S. under Trump withdrew in 2018, and ever since uh, that withdrawal. It has imposed a number of sanctions against uh, Iran, and uh, and that also has basically led to a kind of uh, a snowballing into different other regional uh, confrontations. Some some of those are of course uh, clearly uh, between U.S. and uh, uh, Iran, but some of them are indirectly through different uh, quote unquote proxies. So uh, it seems that both the countries, though there has been negotiations going on. Uh, for a very long time to revive the nuclear deal, the U.S. is quite reluctant to do so, uh, and uh, and and it seems it is completely it seems at this moment uh, uh, out of question, particularly given the fact that the uh, U.S. is already entering into the election phase, and uh, right. during the election, uh, Biden would not basically is not in no in, in no position and not willing to take the kind of uh, take the issue and create another set of uh, 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 things where it has to be held accountable. Because if we remember uh, during the last election, Biden, uh, Biden had promised that he want, his administration, if comes so far, would revive the deal. And it has, right. uh, it has been almost four years and nothing has happened on, on that, those fronts. Uh, so uh, it seems that this deal is a standalone deal and there, uh, this will not have much uh, uh, impact on the larger uh, Iranian uh, Iran US relationship at this moment. Uh, yeah. All right, Abdul, thanks very much for uh, both those updates, and uh, we'll see you soon uh, as the stories develop. Thanks a lot. And finally, about 5,000 senior doctors and dentists in New Zealand will go on strike on September 5, and this will be just the first round of protests. The doctors decided to go on strike after pay negotiations failed. We go to Anish for more on the story. Anish, thanks very much for joining us. Anish, can you tell us what the demands of the doctors are and why those negotiations they were having failed? 
Well, uh, the demands are not very different from what we've seen with uh, similar strikes uh, of health workers, in not just in New Zealand, but also different parts of the world. Now, uh, some of the, the main demand is actually uh, for a wage, uh, a fair wage contract uh, that is adjusted with the consumer price index. And that is something that is very specific primarily because uh, A, it is one, uh, big, uh, it is coming from senior doctors, established, tenured, uh, public uh, public system doctors uh, and those are not junior doctors who who may not have the same kind of job security either. So they are really talking about real wages being cut over the years, uh, especially since the pandemic, especially since the cost of living crisis has spiraled. And this is something that the government has not really uh, taken uh, account of when it comes to uh, you know negotiating deals with their public employees. Uh, nurses were one of them. Uh, earlier this year, we uh, we did cover uh, a set of nurses strike strikes that actually uh, did have the same set of demands. A couple of years ago, we did have uh, junior doctors uh, striking on a very similar set of demands, talking about uh, a rising cost of living crisis, uh, which was already there in many ways in New Zealand before uh, the pandemic hit, but it's now something that has been exacerbated. To the point where uh, doctors are saying that the current deal, the, the existing deal and the deal that the government is offering will actually give them 11% decrease in their real wages over the next few years. That is something significantly, like that will actually significantly uh, bring down their uh, standard of living, A, not just as doctors uh, in the public healthcare system, but also as you know, average wage earners. Uh, uh, average public wage earners in a system right. that is becoming increasingly expensive over the years. Anish, also, New Zealand is heading for elections, so not the most opportune time to have, uh, you know, doctors, dentists basically, uh, you know, fall out with the government in this way. Exactly. Uh, it is actually happening in September. There are three strikes that have been planned. A fourth one is still being debated. So we are already looking at uh, a good part of the election season uh, being marked by uh, senior doctors striking uh, and walking out from their uh, uh, from their workplaces, and that is something that is going to seriously dent, uh, you know, the pro labor uh, kind of uh, image that the uh, that the labor government is trying to present, uh, especially under the uh, the new prime minister, and that is not going to go down well in the general elections either. Uh, in the, the previous uh, general election, we saw uh, the Labour government uh, winning a very a clear majority. That is not something that we can expect at the moment. Uh, there have been multiple polls that are already saying that they are uh, very neck to neck uh, in competition with the Conservatives. And that is really not good uh, for uh, the Labour at a time like this. So, and on top of that, this, they are, uh, doctors are highlighting something that is, that is affecting everybody, every single working class in New Zealand at the moment. And this is something that the labor has really failed to actually address, which is, uh, to keep up wages with the rising cost of living. And that is something that, uh, the rising inflation, especially. And that is something that is going to really affect uh, how, uh, you know, labor issues are dealt with in the election campaigns as well, including the promises that they might make during the campaign. So we need to wait and see how that will, uh, you know, play out over, uh, over the next one month or so. But this is definitely going to put a significant pressure on the current government to actually make something, uh, you know, do something about the negotiation, come up with a better pay package, perhaps, and maybe off, uh, you know, offer some kind of promises at the current moment to keep the strike away. There is a significant pressure at the moment, and we need to see if they are going to keep these warnings. Right, Anish. Thanks very much for joining us with that update. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We will see you again on Tuesday. Our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts have more of our stories, and our YouTube channel has more updates. And this show, Daily Debrief. Remember to subscribe, and thanks again for watching.